Welcome to a very special edition of Conversations on MS. I'm Kelsey Morrow, Education Manager at the Rocky Mountain MS Center. I would also like to thank the pharmaceutical companies who have provided patient education grants to support this series. Thank you to Biogen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Today's session will feature not one, but three MS specialist neurologists answering your questions. We have compiled some of the more common patient questions that the MS Center medical team has recently heard, and we've also included questions that were asked but not addressed during the Q&A session at our latest education summit in October. Dr. Corboy will be moderating the event today. He is the medical director at the Rocky Mountain MS Center and director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado. In 1997, he founded the University of Colorado Multiple Sclerosis Center, now transformed into the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado, a multidisciplinary group offering state-of-the-art care and research to MS patients. Dr. Corboy is joined by Dr. Enrique Alvarez, who is the Vice Chair of Clinical Research in the CU Department of Neurology, and also Dr. Terry Schreiner, who is the Director of the Neuroimmunology Clinic for Children at Children's Hospital. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only. All decisions regarding MS treatment and medications should be discussed with your neurologist. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Corboy. Thanks, Kelsey. That's great. I appreciate that. And I'd thank Dr. Alvarez and Dr. Schreiner for uh, joining us today. Um, we will not get to every single question um, that some people might have, but we're going to get to quite a few that were not answered at the recent summit. So we'll just step right in and we'll ask a couple right away. And we'll ask Dr. Alvarez first. Um, do inflammation levels and disability correlate? Uh, that is thinking about neurofilamentite and heavy discussion that we, uh, we've had at various times. And uh, what the person asked is they said, I think what I learned at the Ed Summit is that neurofilament light isn't really a very effective biomarker for seeing if someone has active MS. Dr. Alvarez? Uh, yeah, so I think like a lot of these questions, the answer might be maybe, um, right? So I, I, um, if you're catching somebody with very active disease, you, can, uh, you may not need neurofilament light. Um, if you can get it tested fairly soon, I think that that's a, a helpful test uh, to look at. Um, the, the challenges uh, for the neurofilament light test and, and what I presented was is that it, the levels may not go up very fast and may not go down very fast, meaning um, a, a level that's high today may look like disease activity that was present maybe six months ago or three months ago. And that's where it's a little bit hard to know because you're not getting sort of levels along the the whole time spectrum. So you're kind of taking little snippets. So you're not sure if the levels are going up, they're going down uh, and those kinds of things, unless you do them very frequently. And at that point, then you're, you're probably not wanting to get blood draw, you know, every month or every few months. Um, and some of the guidelines have suggested looking at neurofilm and light levels, for example, every two to three months uh, to try and paint that picture a little bit. Um, so I think it's helpful sometimes to kind of try and tell the difference between sort of a relapse versus a pseudo relapse. Um, as John uh, Corboy mentioned, you know, the issue of correlation with disability and inflammation, the challenge is, is that the inflammation then leads to the disability and disability probably better matches neurofilament heavy or neurofilament heavy matches better disability levels than neurofilament light. Uh, because neurofilament heavy, heavy levels probably go up and down even slower than neurofilament light levels. Um, so uh, neurofilament light are probably a better marker for inflammation. It's just uh, how fast does it move up or down is one of the questions that we still have about it. Perfect. All right, this is for Dr. Schreiner. Is it important to reduce inflammation in the body and how do you do this? So I think the question relates to we talk a lot about inflammation, for example, in the pathology of MS lesions, but this is talking about generalized inflammation, I think, or you may even see it a little bit differently. Well, I think that's a really interesting distinction. As I was thinking about this, there's inflammation in the body, in our system. We call it systemic inflammation. We care about that because that can be associated with 
disease states that we don't want. Um, and we think about inflammation in the brain more often with multiple sclerosis and the inflammation specifically being maybe a chronic indolent um, inflammation, but more specifically these discrete episodes of inflammation that we call flares or exacerbations. So in general, I like to tell my patients that inflammation in the body is important. We care about it. And we can influence that in a variety of different ways. One popular way and one powerful way is by what we eat. There are certain foods that are pro-inflammatory, and they are things like red meat and saturated fats more um, broadly and processed foods. We want to eat those in a minimum and really focus on more whole foods. These are um, fruits, vegetables, you know, foods that you can look at where you actually know the ingredients and can pronounce them and also exercise. So these are two powerful ways that we can sort of influence inflammation in the body. And another tenant that I like to share with patients generally is in general, what is good for your heart is good for your brain. And this, again, sort of reiterates that like diet and exercise are so important. They are important for your cardiovascular health, but those same things can really be beneficial for your central nervous system health as well. And so I do not espouse any one particular diet. Many, many have been um, published and have been identified as anti-inflammatory diets. I think more specifically, what I would recommend is really just focusing on whole foods, getting out, getting exercise, and really living a clean, healthy life. And that might answer one of the questions down the road as well. Um, the next question is, is there ever a role for multiple immunomodulating agents to be used at the same time? For example, choosing two agents that attack the issue through different mechanisms. Well, that's an intriguing question. Um, you know, for many years, we had no treatments for MS that were sort of the immunotherapies, uh, whereas our colleagues in rheumatology were using not one, but two, or even sometimes three different therapies together. And so in their realm, they have been doing this for quite some time, and clearly in chemotherapy for cancer, that's been going on for quite some time, and other, other types, even multiple antibiotics sometimes for the same bacteria. So it's not unusual to use combination therapies in general in medicine, but we've been a little bit slow to this. There have been a number of studies that have looked at this in the past. And uh, one uh, that we were involved with many years was, uh, years ago was called the ACT trial, Avonex combination trial. People who are on interferon beta-1A Avonex, but who were having ongoing disease activity, and this is long before the more highly effective therapies, were then put into one of several groups. Either one, just stay in the Avonex alone, to add methotrexate, an old uh, therapy that's used for rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions, uh, and that would be taken weekly, orally, or uh, Avonex plus uh, steroids every two months. I believe it was uh, three grams of steroids every two months, uh, or a combination of all three. And um, this study unfortunately showed that there was no significant benefit of adding any of those things together that was greater than uh, uh, just the uh, Avonex alone. And I'm sorry, uh, actually one of those was just Avonex alone. Yeah, I said Avonex alone was the first one. So there, there just wasn't anything that was shown with that. And so there has been some reluctance on the part of neurologists to do uh, combination therapies with more highly effective therapies because of the concern of additive risk for immunosuppression and perhaps infection and other complications. I would say the other way to think about it, however, would be the following. If we really think that you might want to do several different types of approaches with MS, one would be immunotherapy, one might be neuroprotective therapy, that is protect the nerve cells and the supportive cells from dying if they've been partially damaged. One might be remyelination strategies where you can increase the production of myelin wrapping around the cable, the axon of the nerve, or, or perhaps even regeneration therapies where you might actually try to uh, regrow nerves or supportive cells inside the nervous system. You could, you could certainly conceive of doing those two approaches together and, and not necessarily have an increased risk of immunosuppression or other complications. Those would be really complementary and not additive. And so you could imagine, for example, that there's some animal data with a metformin, a very commonly used diabetes drug, or with one of the statin drugs that's used for high cholesterol, simvastatin, 
Uh, and these show potential benefit, for example, in progressive MS. You could potentially do a study where you would add those to one of our immunotherapies. And we have contemplated studies like that. We've tried to get funding for them. So far, we've been unfortunately not successful in getting the funding. But those kinds of approaches, I think, are uh, a different way that you could potentially see, even treating someone from the very beginning of their uh, time with MS with other therapies that would be uh, actually completely complementary to the approach with immunotherapies. Um, the next question has to do with insomnia. What about insomnia caused by MS? Or maybe the first question is for Dr. Alvarez, is it caused by MS? Or is it really related to MS, but maybe indirectly so? And the patient asks, I do not fall asleep on my own and haven't since diagnosis 35 years ago. I've done all the behavioral stuff already and then dot, dot, dot. And maybe then what is maybe going on? What are some approaches that I might be looking at? Yeah, so I, I, there are case reports of primary insomnia associated with MS where lesions are actually in areas that can cause um, you know, sleep apnea or things like this. I think some of that is a little bit uh, more the exception than the rule. Um, we definitely find a lot of our patients with difficulty falling asleep. Um, sometimes, and I think most of the times, it's things that that are secondary to the MS, you know? So if you have pain, are you managing the pain uh, that's keeping people awake? If you have bladder issues and you're having to get up four times to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you're gonna have some insomnia associated with that. Um, anxiety, stress, um, other life factors, depression, um, all those things will affect uh, the sleep quality. Um, so there's a lot of things that MS can affect that affects sleep. Uh, and working on those things uh, becomes very important. Um, I stress sleep a lot because I think it's one of those things that um, we're very good at getting people to sleep. Uh, most of our drugs are very sedating, so they make people sleep. Um, you know, um, you know the the. You know, I think the harder part is keeping people awake to some things, but sometimes even with memory problems and other things like this, you know, it, it's a problem stemming from not sleeping well and trying to address that um, can help so many other things. Um, so if it takes meds, it takes meds. It's kind of like one of those things I wouldn't be hesitant to take medicines for bladder if that was what, you know, the issues are. Uh, so take advantage of those medicines. And that's one thing that we can, can definitely help out with usually fairly, fairly well. Right. And I'll add, um, oh, Enrique, ahead. I'm just going to jump in. Yeah, that sure. There also are doctors, our colleagues um, who specialize in sleep. And so sometimes if, if you are trying a couple different things with your neurologist and not getting anywhere, sometimes a sleep study and actually seeing a sleep specialist can be helpful. So occasionally I'll make that referral if you're taking a look at all the things, you know, the caffeine and are you exercising and are you eliminating sweets and it's still, you know, a problem. And certainly for 35 years, that's a problem. It may be worthwhile going to see a specialist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question has to do with uh, heat sensitivity. This is for Dr. Schreiner. Heat sensitivity is related to UTOS phenomenon. Uh, nerve conduction goes down as temperature goes up. How is the heat sensitivity related to lesions? Mm, okay, good question. So I'm going to tackle this one with a little bit of anatomy first, and I'm going to use the, the technology I have and say our brain is built of billions of neurons. Neurons have axons. Let's present, let's pretend this cord for my headset here is an axon. Electricity is going to travel along this axon, sending a signal from up here that says, move my left arm. And if everything is perfect along that path, it's going to happen instantaneously. If there's been a lesion in this axon, let's say in my brain because of MS, and that axon has either been damaged or damaged and healed, but not healed to the same capacity of before, it's going to, the electricity is going to travel a little differently along this axon. And when you are recovered from your relapse, you're not going to notice really that things travel a little differently along that axon because you're compensating and signals are getting where they need to go for the most part, let's say. But when you heat up, signals don't travel along 
this axon as well. That's when you're going to notice the symptoms. And the symptoms come because the signals going either from like, let's say up here, your motor cortex to your arm are slower. The arm's not going to move the same way. And that will remind you of the relapse um, that you've had in the past. Or from a sensory perspective, if this axon isn't working really well, then the signals over here that give my fingertips feeling aren't going to get to the part of my brain that's going to process that as well. And so Uthoff's phenomenon just refers to that very physics-like property that things just don't travel very well along damaged axons when they're hot. Now, is this damaging? Is this hurtful to you? No. You're going to notice the symptoms, though. Many of my patients say when they're in a hot tub, when they're in a sauna, when they get out of the shower, whatever, they will have that sort of symptom that they have had in the past come back and represent. It doesn't mean that there's anything new going on. It's just that that symptom is manifest now because the signals aren't traveling the same way in the heat. So I hope that answers the question. It's not a, it's not a um, dangerous thing to have those return of symptoms when you get hot, but when you cool down, they should go away. All right, perfect. Um, the next one's for me. Uh, this is a question about stem cells. And it asks, can you talk about the TISH stem cell study? And uh, the Tisch uh, uh, MS Center is in New York. Saud Sadiq is a longtime uh, clinical researcher at the center in New York. And uh, they have been doing studies uh, trying to assess whether or not you can actually produce regeneration inside the nervous system. Now, when most people talk about stem cells, they're talking about bone marrow derived stem cells and these bone marrow derived stem cells are taken from a couple of different sources and someone will typically have those removed from their body, stored, perhaps actually um, um, amplified so there are more cells available, stored, and then someone will receive some chemotherapy to reduce or eliminate the cells that are presently in their bloodstream. They potentially uh, bad effector cells such as the lymphocytes, the white blood cells that seem to cause MS. And then you can give back the bone marrow stem cells and you rescue the bone marrow uh, so that uh, if there's been damage to the bone marrow from the chemotherapy, you can give those cells back, they regenerate the bone marrow and you recover. The logic is that you reboot the immune system. And this is an immunotherapy approach. But what they're doing at Tish is a little bit different and there are some others as well doing different approaches. They're using a related type of stem cell called a mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cell. And they're using so-called neural progenitors. These are cells that are not really necessarily bone marrow drive, but they're, they've already started to delineate themselves and differentiate into what are called neural progenitor cells. Uh, and these are the ones who will ultimately become cells that would normally live inside your nervous system. And these can be derived from a couple different sources as well. And then they're treated in ways to make these cells uh, start acting like and going down the pathway towards becoming neural cells. And so what they have done is they have a phase one study that was started in 2014, reported on in 2021 with 20 patients, and they were all given three uh, different treatments of these mesenchymal neural progenitor cells into the spinal fluid. So do a spinal tap and instead of taking fluid out, you put the cells in. And then they followed people and they published this originally in 2018. And then a follow-up uh, two year study later in 2021. And what they essentially showed with this, and I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit from their abstract here so I can make sure I get it correct. Um, and what they showed was 18 of these 20 study participants completed the full two year follow-up. And mostly in a phase one study, you're looking at safety. And what they showed was that the patients did pretty well. There were no long-term serious adverse events associated with the use of these cells. And then they also looked at some outcomes and they looked at measures of disability. And of the 20, seven su subjects showed uh, sustained improvement in disability over two years, although the degree of improvement was not maintained in five of those subjects. So they got better, but then they got a little bit worse again. Three of the 10 ambulatory one patients 
showed sustained improvement in 25 foot time walk. And then they also looked at some biomarker analyses as well. So from a safety point of view, there was no concern and that would allow them to go on and do a phase two study, which would be larger, uh, more controlled, that is not open where everybody knew what they got. And they're in fact doing that now. So the phase two study is underway now. And in the phase two study, it's gonna be 50 people and it's a crossover design. Half the people will get a sham treatment up front, and half the people will get the actual treatment. And then after a period of time, they will switch. And the people who got the sham treatment will get the actual treatment and vice versa. And this is underway right now in New York. Uh, I don't have any other further update on this, um, but the phase two trial is fully enrolled and is underway and they expect the results they said in 2022, but the most recent meeting at Actrums, I did not see anything on this. I don't know if uh, Dr. Schreiner or Dr. Uh, Alvarez did, but I did not see any further updates on this study. I would say there's another study underway looking at uh, neural stem cells that are slightly different, but there's the same idea to give uh, neural progenitor cells. And these are uh, uh, derived from other cells and then induced to go down the phase, uh, the pathway of neural progenitor cells. And these are similarly being given into the spinal fluid intrathecally. And the logic in this study, it's a phase one, two study. And the logic is to first see that it's safe and also secondarily to see if there's any evidence when, when you go back later and take spinal fluid out to test of any growth factors that are being produced that would be important for stimulating the cells that are already inside the brain to actually further differentiate and become cells that are fully functioning neural cells. And so I, I similarly have not seen any recent follow-up on that, but that was a small study, I think at about four sites, maybe five in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the concept was again, to see that that was safe. Did the cells survive and did they produce these growth factors? So this is a very interesting new approach in general that will look at whether or not we can actually regenerate nerves, which is different from rebooting the immune system. Um, the next study is a broad one. We might all answer a little bit about this and I'll have Dr. Schreiner lead off. Um, can you address the risks of ocrevus? What is the actual process of how rituximab and ocrevus in the body, how, how do they work? How does the med uh, medication attack the B lymphocytes? What happens after that? Do the destroyed cells just slough off and get removed from the body through urine? How can I support my body through the process? And just sort of what then happens and what should people watch out for? Okay, all good questions and definitely all related. I'm gonna tackle this one sort of globally first and say that rituximab, ocrelizumab, ofatumumab are all in this category of medicines who uh, or which are designed with one particular purpose in mind, and that is to find these B cells that have name tags that say, I'm a CD20 cell, and to attach to them and to lyse them, to destroy them. Um, this is a very powerful and efficacious mechanism in MS to prevent relapses, and we use these medicines a lot. The side effects that were the sort of first part of that question can come in sort of two buckets. The first one is like, well, what happens? What, what are potential side effects when that lysis happens, when those B cells are destroyed? And then what are the effects subsequently of having no B cells? And so the first bucket I'll take first, and that one's relatively straightforward. When the, when the antibody, when the, let's say, ocrevus attaches to the CD20 cell, you know, again, that B cell that's wearing the name tag, I'm a CD20, and lyses it, there are a number of pro-inflammatory signals that go out. Pro-inflammatory signals are kind of like, hey, something's going on here. Let's all get excited. And they're inflammatory. They're pro-inflammatory signals. So this means that people can feel kind of lousy, particularly with the first infusion, sometimes with the second, and then it sort of decreasing intervals subsequently. But that might feel like I'm hot 
I'm flushed, I'm red, I might have hives, maybe my throat's a little scratchy, and occasionally it becomes even more severe than that. But those are the infusion reactions, the side effects that can occur at the time of the infusion as a direct result of how the medicine works. The adverse effects of Ocrevus, let any of them in the category, result mostly from not having B cells. So what does that mean? It means you can get infections more easily. And the infections can be common day infections like the crud, runny nose, cough, sneezing, upper respiratory stuff. It can be urinary tract infections, particularly in women. And it can be other types of infections as well, some of them more rare like varicella um, that can occur more easily in the absence of B cells because taking out the B cells is a very effective way of treating MS, but it also means that you don't have all the positive effects of the B cells also. And some of the positive effects include ramping up the immune system so that when you are under attack by a virus or bacteria, the immune system can respond quickly. And so I think I've got it most of that. Um, John, Enrique, I don't know if you want to pick up anything I may have left off. I, I just might add that in, in the more chronic sense, clearly the thing that's most important in terms of risks or, or side effects would be the risk of infection. And we ultimately care about that as people use the drug for a longer period of time, as the patient ages, many of the patients might have primary progressive MS and are diagnosed at a later age. And I'll get to that in the next question. Uh, and so uh, we have the short-term issues with the infusion reactions. But ultimately, people get over those pretty rapidly, pretty uh, pretty often, and it's really mostly the long-term issues like that, and then some rare other uh, side effects, but infections far and away dominate our concerns. Yeah, um, I would mention, you know, when people start talking about different, you know, how does it kill the cells, that there's actually several mechanisms and the different drugs will kind of do that differently. Um, and uh, in, in my book, it doesn't, I don't know that it really matters whether you use something more like a CDC heavy way to do that or an ADCC way to do that, um, which are technical ways to kind of say, if I shoot you or I stab you, does it really matter? And I think most of us don't really see much of a difference from that perspective. Most of those infusion reactions are because of the stuff that's inside those cells, especially with when you have a lot of cells uh, that can release a lot of chemicals. And so how to support that, the one thing is to hydrate a lot during the infusions, do this the infusions kind of on the slower side of things. If you have B cells present, meaning if you're infusing more, if it's been a while since your last infusion, for example, and you've let those B cells come back, if it's your first infusion where you have your full number of B cells, those infusions happen really slowly, hopefully. Um, to kind of let those chemicals kind of wash out. And then, yeah, the, the risk factors are really the big ones because the infusion reactions tend to be manageable pretty easily. And I, yeah. I would, the one thing I would add to that is that um, there's going to be a new drug hopefully approved this month uh, called Ublituximab, which is the same family, but works a slightly different way and may be the most effective killer of cells, although I agree a dead cell is still a dead cell, but you might be able to clear different stores of the B lymphocytes in different body parts. We only measure the blood, but the lymph nodes, perhaps the nervous system, liver, spleen, and other places where B cells may live and even sequester themselves might be treated differently with different medications. And, uh, and the new uh, therapies that we're also studying, BTK inhibitors, cross over into the, uh, the brain and the spine and they may have effects directly inside the brain, especially on B cells and other cells like microglia. So um, not all B cell therapies are necessarily the same. They have some different attributes, but all of those, the BTK inhibitors and the anti-CD20s, we would call B cell therapies, uh, but they would work potentially differently. And Terry, do you have something to add? Yeah, I did. I thought of one other thing that I wanted to mention, which is in that category of infectious risk, which is for some people, the longer they are on these medicines that again, take out the B cells, there is a subsequent risk that the pool of antibodies in the blood may decrease over time. And that is because the production of antibodies is a downstream effect for some of these B cells. And so 
measuring antibodies, particularly for people who have been on these therapies for a while, can be very helpful to make sure that those aren't drifting too low, which again would increase the infection risk. All righty. Uh, I'm going to skip around a little bit on our list here. So I'm going to come back to Dr. Alvarez and I'm going to relieve Dr. Schreiner of one of her questions. I'm going, to combine, uh, I'm going to combine a couple questions here uh, because they're both about sensory function. And these are for Dr. Alvarez. What makes your hand and feet tingle all the time if you have a sensory problem related to MS? And related, one person asked, I recently lost 8% of my feeling in my shoulder. I think it was a flare up. When flares occur and the body has a new side effect, is that that way forever? And so I, I thought we might combine those and just talk about yeah. the, the, you know, the many different effects of sensory dysfunction and what do they mean? Yeah, so the tingles uh, or paresthesias would be sometimes the term that we use for it. Um, and, and for us a little bit, it's uh, separating and it's hard to do that. I mean, we try sometimes to, to be very precise with our words, but it's a little bit hard when in practice, right? The, the difference between numbness or the lack of sensation versus having tingling because a lot of times as the sensation comes back, it's not the most pleasant of sensations and it becomes some of that tingling. So that tends to be a result of nerve damage. Uh, it can be nerve damage associated from MS or other things. You can find patients with diabetic neuropathies or strokes who have a lot of paresthesias associated with them. Um, you mentioned specifically hands and feet. That's a common place to have that. Uh, especially feet, probably more so than even hands. And it just has to do a little bit with those tend to be longer nerves. So there's a little bit more chance that they are kind of at that teeter-totter point of not working quite as well, uh, where paresthesias or tingles could kind of happen. Um, so again, it, it could be MS, it could be other things like that. And that's part of, you know, something to discuss with, with your neurologist uh, or primary care doc. Uh, to kind of get evaluated for some of those things. And then the second question was kind of damage uh, and how permanent is it? Well, um, it, that number is variable and it's always hard to predict. Uh, as a population, about 40% of relapses tend to leave you with symptoms associated with them. Uh, so it's almost like a 50-50 chance of, well, you get back to normal from that episode or will that episode leave you with symptoms associated with that? Um, we try to differentiate, you know, things like relapses from pseudo relapses, because in pseudo relapses, there's not new damage associated with that. It's just the nerves don't work quite as well as Dr. Schreiner was describing before. Uh, with the Oudhaus phenomena, you cool down, things start to work again, uh, for example, or with infections or other things like that. In those cases, we would like to expect to kind of see symptoms going away pretty much 100% of the time. Um, so again, with, with new inflammation symptoms, um, it's just the damage and where the damage is that's kind of resulting in those symptoms. All right, I'm going to take one on late onset MS, and there's not a formal definition of late onset MS, uh, but many people refer to uh, anyone ha who has new symptoms after age 50. Now, this does not mean being diagnosed after 50, because oftentimes someone will come in after age 50 and they'll say, well, actually, when I was 35, I had numbness from the waist down, but I, you know, it went away and I didn't go see anybody about it, but that was almost assuredly related. But for late onset, over age 50, about 7 to 8% of people are diagnosed with MS uh, with first symptoms after 50. After age 60, it's less than 1%. And uh, we've all seen them, but um, over age 70 is even, you know, it's a very small number. So the reality is that the majority of people are diagnosed between uh, roughly about 20 and 45 uh, with about 5% of patients being pediatric MS and seeing Dr. Schreiner, and then a much smaller number at the top end over 50 or 60. Um, are they different? Well, they are different. Uh, other than um, just being less common, uh, as people age, uh, the difference between uh, onset in men versus women changes. In younger patients, it's a high degree uh, of patients are uh, female, uh, and uh, the number overall for the population in the United States is about 2.8 or 3 to 1, female to male. But in middle age, that number is closer to sort of 60% uh, to 40%, so still predominant for women, uh, but the ratio is uh, much lower. 
So that's a difference. Another difference is that in younger patients, especially in pediatric patients, uh, almost everybody has relapsing MS. Uh, it's, it's almost unheard of for a, a pediatric patient to have a progressive MS at, out, at uh, onset. Uh, whereas in middle age, some studies have even up to 30, 40, or 50% of people will have progression at the onset without having relapses, or at least not at first. That's a difference. In addition, when people have late onset MS, they are more likely to progress with disability more rapidly than younger onset. Now, the younger onset patients, especially pediatric patients, may reach disability levels earlier, but that's because they start younger. Uh, the reality is, is that the older patients will actually have progression of disability more rapidly and will achieve those score in, in a lesser period of time. Also, when older patients uh, have relapses, and they can have relapses for sure, um, the relapses tend to be, number one, less uh, less common, number two, less severe, but number three, unfortunately, as we age, nothing seems to heal as well, and as true with MS relapses as well, people don't often recover as well from those relapses. So there are definitely differences between people who are younger and older with regard to how they present. Sometimes there's differences, for example, in whether or not people have multiple symptoms at once compared to just a single symptom. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with recovery, disability progression, and the nature of the MS as people age. Um, and uh, ultimately though, if someone has what looks like run of the mill relapsing MS and they're 55 years old when they're diagnosed, we treat them like run of the mill relapsing MS. So the treatments are not terribly different, except that the treatments, unfortunately, for progressive MS are not as effective as they are in relapsing MS in younger patients. Um, so uh, we have a couple of um, a couple of questions uh, that we can do relatively quickly, I think. And Dr. Schreiner actually got to uh, part of this before, and this had to do with how to prevent brain aging and proactive suggestions for long-time brain health. And uh, the, the, the simple answer is good habits. But what are those good habits, Dr. Schreiner? Well, I did talk to some of them earlier. Um, they are um, diet, again, eating the foods you can pronounce, knowing where they've come from. Um, I, I tell my pediatric patients to be wary of things like, um, uh, uh, what is spicy, not Fritos, but like the, the Cheetos. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Things that just don't look like food. They are, they're <laughs> probably not what you should be eating. So instead, again, there are many, many types of diets that have been tested. Um, diet studies are hard to do. And so I'm not going to look to the evidence uh, and we're not going to talk to that specifically, but I will say that um, it, among them, the diet that has the best evidence for many kinds of neurologic disorders is the Mediterranean diet. And so if you would like to have a set diet to follow, that's a reasonable one. But the more broad categories are looking for things like whole foods, fruits, vegetables, strive for five every day, get your protein one way or another, um, and really monitor your saturated fats um, and you know your red meats. So diet is one piece of that. Exercise is another big piece of that. And um, the exercise should be cardiovascular if you can, um, to some extent, several times per day. It should be anti-gravity to keep your body and your bones healthy. And along those lines, if you are exercising, all of the things that pertain to other people pertain to you too. That means wear a helmet if you're on anything with wheels. If you're a skier, wear a helmet, protect your brain, do everything that you can to um, promote brain health by preventing everyday things that can injure your brain just like anyone else. And I guess maybe I'll pause there and allow my colleagues to add their pearls sure. as well. Enrique? I don't know that I have much to add to that. I mean, I think it's just, you know, the umbrella of healthy living. Yeah, and I would say just a couple of specific ones. Um, one, uh, definitely do not smoke. And if you smoke, please quit. Uh, two, 
treat other conditions, comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure. If you need your hip replaced and that's affecting your walking as well as your MS is affecting your walking, get your hip replaced if you need a hip replaced. So treat the other things that you can treat and, and treat your body with the respect that it deserves. Um, all right, we're gonna have, uh, well, hopefully be, uh, we have about 15 minutes left or so, and we're gonna try and uh, answer some questions relatively rapidly. Um, and some will be a little bit um, seemingly hard to do that, but maybe if we bring it down, we can probably do that. So the first question is for Dr. Alvarez, the difference between a MOD drug and a MAB drug. Uh, yeah, so they sound very similar, but very different. So the, the, the MABs are monoclonal antibodies. Um, and so that can be you know, anything from Tisavri to the B-cell depleting drugs uh, in that group of drugs. Um, MOD specifically refers to the S1P inhibitor. So fingolimod, siponimod, ozonimod, and panesimod. Um, and so that group of drugs then finishes off in MOD, and it's kind of what they share in common. Yeah, and so interesting, the MABs are many different classes. The MODs are one class, but have four different groups uh, within them, and, and now generics for uh, fingolimod as well. Um, this one is for, uh, this one is for me, actually. Um, I used to have MRIs with contrast. I'm no longer receiving MRIs with contrast. Why is that? Uh, well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, several years ago, there were a couple of studies that came out that looked at autopsy materials and looked at one of the types of contrast agents and found that individuals who had four or more MRI scans with contrast and that contrast material, when you looked at autopsy, you could find evidence that the contrast had gotten into the brain. Uh, why the brain specifically? Well, the brain is a very fatty part of your body because all of that myelin is made up of fat and protein. And these uh, contrast agents specifically were very lipophilic. They love fat, so they will bind to fat. The question remained as to whether or not this actual concentration, which was very, very low, uh, would have any potential damage. And no one was ever able to show much in the way of toxicity. But that, and in combination with the development of more highly effective therapies where we were seeing less and less new active lesions that would be detected by the gadolinium um, suggested that maybe we just weren't getting much bang for our buck by adding the extra cost of the dye, by adding potential toxicity that we hadn't recognized, um, and just time in the scanner was long longer. So it became much more the norm to do our long-term surveillance studies with these scans typically of the brain alone, sometimes with the spine, and do them without the contrast because we didn't learn that much that was extra. In addition, there have been other sequences that we now get on a routine basis, especially diffusion-weighted imaging sequences, that actually give us a lot of the same kind of information that we get from the contrast. Is that an active lesion with inflammation, or is that just an old lesion or a quiet lesion that does, have, does not have active inflammation? So there are other sequences that also allow us to perhaps get by without the contrast. Um, this one is also for uh, Dr. Alvarez. Bones often tend to weaken with age. Does MS accelerate this? Uh, so that's a great question. So uh, yes and no again. Uh, Directly, uh, Dr. Schreiner already mentioned the, the aspect of when trying to do exercise to try and do gravity exercise because weight-bearing exercise will help strengthen those bones. So with disability, you will see that bones do weaken as things decondition. The bones decondition in a sense as well, and they can kind of get weaker. Um, this was particularly much more of an issue, I think, in the past before we recognize the role of vitamin D, uh, we would recommend a lot of calcium. And then we realized that the vitamin D was really important to absorb that calcium. And so you'll see that we don't recommend calcium as much as we used to, and that we recommend vitamin D so that you can absorb that calcium. And thirdly, one of the other things that used to thin out bones a lot in MS patients was steroids. And so with uh, steroid use would thicken out bones. Um, and we used to use steroids because that was the only thing that we had in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and really 90s. And we still use them, uh, uh, you know, some, but not as much. 
Um, and so that has helped, I think, our ability to prevent that disability has helped. And so we're starting to, I think, see that connection with MS a little bit kind of go away. And um, uh, here's one uh, for me, this is a relatively brief one. Is weight gain a side effect of tisobri? If so, what can be done to prevent further weight gain? To my knowledge, and looking at the package insert, I'm, I'm not aware that there's any weight gain that's associated with the use of tisobri made lizmab. Uh, however, we use a variety of different agents. That, that is an issue. Um, one of the main things with chronic steroids, as Dr. Uh, uh, Alvarez was just talking about, is that uh, if you use them chronically, weight gain is a dramatic problem for a lot of people. But there are other drugs that we use on a more regular basis, gabapentin and pregabalin, for example, amitriptyline and nortriptyline. These are drugs that we use as uh, symptomatic therapies for MS that are commonly associated with weight gain. And, and interestingly enough, we use some medications such as uh, topiramate or topamax. Uh, we use primarily for migraine in our world, but uh, can be used for seizures and other things as well. And that's associated with weight loss. Uh, and so uh, weight gain and or weight loss is common with other drugs, but not really uh, typically seen uh, with Tysabri. Um, uh, I'm gonna have several questions in a row for Dr. Schreiner. How do you know if you've had the Epstein-Barr virus? So some people will know if they've had Epstein-Barr virus, if they had it episode in teenage years usually of mono, mononucleosis, which can be a month or longer of intense fatigue, swollen glands. It, that is a clinical syndrome that commonly is caused by Epstein-Barr virus, and Epstein-Barr virus may have been tested if you've gone through that clinical episode. For most people, they have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, but not had that clinical manifestation. And They've never been tested, but we know that there is a link between Epstein-Barr virus and MS with 99% of people with MS having been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, whereas the general population is something less than that. It can be tested in the blood. You can test for active infection. You can test for past infection. Um, I would say it's probably not of a lot of clinical utility if you already have the diagnosis of MS, but it is something that can be tested. The next question is a very brief one. Thoughts on recent addition by the FDA of colitis as a potential side effect of ochreous? So there have been very few cases of colitis that have occurred in patients on Ocrevus, and those cases have usually occurred after the first or second dose of Ocrevus, so early in the course of treatment. And in those few cases, they have been severe. So one at least has required total colectomy um, and they've been refractory to treatment. So these are a few, very few cases of a bad um, event occurring in the time that Ocrevus has been started. So it is something that is on the package insert. Um, it's something we pay attention to if our patients are saying they're having really significant changes in their bowel habits, but I will say it's so uncommon that it is not something that I worry about a lot. And, and bowel problems are a challenge for patients with MS to begin with, and so small fluctuations, even large fluctuations in bowel function are not unusual, but colitis, severe colitis, like unfortunately one person needing a colectomy, has got to be extremely rare amongst the over 200,000 people that have now used the drug. Um, and then yeah, the we mentioned one. that colitis, you know, usually you're looking for looser stools more so, you know, from an MS perspective, it tends to be a little bit more on the constipation side. That's wishy-washy a little bit, but that, that might help kind of see what you're looking for a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the final question is, how do I tell the difference between a, a UTI and an MS-related symptom? And I think what they probably mean is UTI and perhaps a pseudo-attack and MS-related symptoms of a true attack. I think that's what that question is getting at. How, how do you tell the difference? Okay, well, and this is something that we, we think about a lot when our patients call in and they say they're having symptoms. The reason we think about infection in general is because of the uh, 
Uthoff's phenomenon that I spoke about earlier. When the body is ill, temperature may be up, either way, homeostasis is rocked, the immune system is fighting infection. Some of those old symptoms can come back, and we call that the pseudo flare. There is nothing new to point to on the MRI. There's, you know, nothing you can see. You're having symptoms. But there, if there are symptoms that you've had before and you have signs of illness, be it a UTI or upper respiratory infection or other, we would associate those and say this is probably a pseudo relapse. Um, however, occasionally, you know, unfortunately, the nature of the disease is that there can be relapses and that present with new symptoms. So in the absence of infection, if a patient calls in and says, I'm having a new symptom, I've never had that before, it's been there for 24 hours, then we, we want to work that up a little bit more to make sure that that isn't uh, a new spot, new something that you could point to on the MRI. And one of the things we'll commonly ask our patients to do is to check their urine to make sure that they don't have what we call an occult urinary tract infection, which means it's there, but it's not causing the intense burning and bad smelling urine and all that stuff that a urinary tract infection usually would. And then if that is negative, then we go further down the road of evaluating that new symptom. And um, I've never seen a good study, but I think um, certainly as people age, especially the likelihood of, of, of symptoms that are concerning that come back or are new, um, the likelihood goes up uh, that there'll be a pseudo relapse as opposed to a relapse because infections are more common as people age, uh, more common as people become disabled, especially if they have urinary tract dysfunctions uh, and relapses uh, become less common. So I think with aging, it is much more likely and much more deleterious. If you have a bed bound patient with a significant urinary tract infection, heaven forbid urosepsis, where it goes into the bloodstream, it can act like a serious attack. We find no new scan changes or anything like that, but the patient is already serious, severely debilitated and they get knocked down a peg and it is tough for them to come back from that. So it can sort of act like a relapse but it really just means that they're so deconditioned that unfortunately they have a big infection that has a big impact. Um, I think the final question is uh, for me, um, is alpha lipoic acid still thought to be helpful in reducing brain shrinkage and or helping in limiting nerve damage? Uh, any studies addressing its usefulness? And what about biotin? And these two studies, uh, two molecules got studied sorted together with uh, two different studies in each and the biotin studies uh, were a little bit ahead, and both of them showed potential effects um, either on slowing uh, disability and or on brain shrinkage. And the alpha lipoic acid study was focused more on brain shrinkage. Those were primarily out of uh, the uh, VA in Oregon, up in Portland, uh, and showed significant enough effects that a larger study in multiple other sites uh, is being conducted right now um, I'm not sure if they're still recruiting. If they're not, it's just been recently that the recruiting has stopped. And then we're just following up and hopefully we'll have the data for, I believe it's a two-year study, primarily again, focused on brain volume, but also looking at um, progression of disability. And that data has not yet been reported. Uh, regarding the biotin, um, the original studies were quite hopeful, looking at relatively high dose biotin, very much higher than people would get in a typical health food store uh, dosing. And uh, this was studied uh, then in a much larger, well-controlled trial, international trial in Europe and in the US and Canada. And uh, unfortunately, the second trial was a complete negative. Uh, I, I would say um, uh, of all the studies that we've participated in, it may be the single most negative study that I've seen, unfortunately. Uh, it was a very well done study. I mean, so it wasn't a matter of being poorly done or having bad controls or not enough patients with low statistical power. It just unfortunately showed nothing in comparison to uh, placebo, but it had a high bar. They were really trying to show that there was a substantial effect on, uh, on uh, disability and actually we're looking at improvement of disability. And that is a very, very high bar to achieve. The concept uh, is that both of these would be neuroprotective. That is that they would uh, perhaps help damage cells, especially in the case of biotin to produced more energy than they were normally producing because they were damaged and that that would allow the cell to continue to do all of its functions, maintain its membranes 
and not simply die from the prior damage. So um, biotin, uh, no. Uh, if you have thin hair, you might want to use it. If you want to improve your nails, it'd be useful for that as well. But for MS, unfortunately, is a no. And the company no longer exists who did the study. They folded shortly after the study closed. Um, uh, alpha lipoic acid is still pending. So I, just, I think that, oh, go ahead. Just a comment about like the biotin dose. So like for hair and things like this, it's, it's really small doses, like one or 10 milligrams. For the MS dosing, it was 100 milligrams three times a day. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's, it was hard to find. It was hard to kind of stick with it. Uh, from that perspective. Yeah, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't skimp on the dose. No. Um, so um, we'd like to th thank everybody for participating. Thank Dr. Schreiner, Dr. Alvarez for joining me today. Really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to seeing you at further uh, either conversations in MS or education summits, which we do in the fall and the spring. And we hope that uh, we answered all of your questions today. And you'll have more in the future as things develop and more research comes out. So have a great holiday weekend uh, uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks and enjoy the winter seasons.